a special edition of Was It Great or Were You Ate with my great friend, Chris Crawford, baseball expert. This is the time of year to hear Chris Crawford's insights. He's got a channel of his own called My OY. We will link to him down below where he talks about Seattle Mariners baseball. And you're not in the postseason. <laughs> Neither is my team. Yeah. yeah That's okay. It's, not, it's okay. It makes you appreciate when you do make it, of course. My team's only made it once in the past 23 years, and your team seems to like they just have like a pre written thing that like you advance to this series. Um, sometimes they don't go that far, Christy, but uh, they do get to at least get to play. <laughs> the Dodgers had an epic collapse, but that's a whole other conversation for a whole other time. Sure. Um, you had this great idea that you wanted to talk about a movie that means a lot to you from your childhood, and this seems like sort of the exact wheelhouse of things that we like to do here from time to time in the Was It Great or Were You Eight series. You picked The Sandlot from 1993. Yes. Why did you pick this movie? Well, first of all, what's it about? Sure. So The Sandlot is the story of uh, Scott Smalls moving to uh, – San Fernando, I think that's right, it's right San, around there. San Fernando Valley, the valley. Yes, yeah. so uh, he is encouraged by his mom to go make some friends, and he has a stepdad played by Dennis Leary, which is, uh, as a kid, did not really get, but now seems a little bit weirder to me. Mm -hmm. um, meets a group of kids who are kind of a ragtag team of baseball. They're kind of the uh, the misfits, the underdogs. Uh, Tommy uh, Smalls is not good at baseball, has not played it before, they include him in the gang and a whole bunch of wild, wacky adventures take place uh, over the summer of, uh, I don't remember what year they said it. Maybe they don't actually say they what do. year it is. Christine. Oh, it's very oh, specific. It's 1962. Okay. 1962. That's right. A time of innocence in our nation. This is not a <laughs> random year here. This is a time when we were still innocent as a country. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the reason I picked this movie is because... We talked about it on a podcast uh, when I was with NBC that um, we picked our favorite baseball movies and we picked our least favorite baseball movies. And it was my pick for least favorite baseball movie. And the reason is um, I loved this movie as a kid. And then I realized that I was an idiot. I was not a smart young child. <laughs> and Alonzo, uh, when we were talking about it, our good buddy Alonzo mm -hmm. said, was it great or were you eight? Yeah. And that's, I think, what started the segment. So I'm still waiting for those residual checks. <laughs> you know, once the SAG strike ends, we can get those back out to you <laughs> okay. again. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do think, though, that is the impetus of was it great or were you eight, which is a conversation that I love having. And then sure. this crystallized it. So thank you for, yeah, I guess the Sandlot is the reason that this whole series exists. <laughs> yes. So it's not great then. It sounds like you don't think it is. It's not. I think that this is one of the this movie desperately to me wants to be stand by me, but actually for kids really, really wants to be that type of movie. And it relies entirely on nostalgia. And it is so derivative of so many better movies, in my humble estimation. Now, mm -hmm. there are certainly things that I enjoy about the movie. I actually think Dennis Leary's performance is one of the best parts of the movie. I think his. Uh, actually a pretty believable stepdad that's trying to make that effort to work with the kid, but cannot quite find that common ground with him. But a lot of the performances, and I know they're child actors, are not so great in this movie. And mm. I, I have to ask you this specifically, and I'll <laughs> you know give your thoughts, of course. Yeah. The needle drops are so bad in this movie. So <laughs> bad. Every yeah. single one of them is so obvious. In particular... Wendy Peppercorn and this magic moment playing right before the kiss is just like so on the nose. And yeah. I have something you don't realize is on the nose when you're eight. But right. as a glumber glumber world, it becomes a little more obvious that this is not necessarily great filmmaking. Yeah. No, this is bargain basement. Stand by me. <laughs> For sure. Uh, yeah, I'm realizing watching this movie today that I have never seen it. I thought I wow. had. And looking back, it came out in April of 93. I was a senior in college getting okay. ready to graduate. I was 20 years old. And like I devoured film then. But at this point in my life, I would not have sought out the sand lot. Like sure. at this point in my life, I was going by myself to whatever was playing at the art house in the middle of the day. So sure. um, I did not see it. And watching it now, like from the very beginning, I was so uncomfortable. It's so cringe inducing because it's like a, 
it's like one of those Family Guy parodies of like <laughs> the summer that changed everything. Like the, yes. na- the narration, the writer and co-director and narrator, David Mickey Evans, holds your hand through everything and yeah. like has zero faith. And again, as you say, it's for really little kids, but explains everything like that's the summer that I moved with my mom and stepdad to the San Fernando Valley and didn't know anyone. And these kids went to this magical place called the sand lot. And the things that he very easily could have shown us like a better writer, a better filmmaker would have shown us could have shown kids in a way that is self-explanatory without being condescending. Yes. You know, like I think it's, it's, it's possible, you know, and, and like the scene where they, they have their big win and they are all excited and they go to the carnival yes. and they're all dipping for the first time, right? Yeah. Like it's not enough to just let those events unfold in that order. He has to tell us as they are walking up to get tickets for the carnival, we wanted to celebrate. We were <laughs> on top of the world, but we did something that was really stupid. And so rather than just like, let us get sucked into, oh, oh God, they're on the tilt yes. world. And they're all going to yak all over everything. Right. It's just an over and over again. That is the tendency here. And like David Mickey Evans, the director really likes David Mickey Evans, the narrator. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> Includes him <laughs> quite a bit. Um, yeah. But I need you to explain to me though, because you're about 10 years younger than me. This mm-hmm. is a really important formative movie for a lot of people your age. And the nostalgia Absolutely. factor is high. Absolutely. What you're hearing right now was my phone uh, ringing for me making fun of the Sandlot. A lot of people are really upset about that right now. Um, <laughs> the uh, the it is huge, and it is a uh, a formative movie for a lot of sports fans. And it was a successful movie. I looked it up. It made it had a seven million dollar budget, and it made thirty four million dollars in 1993. That's mm-hmm. a hit. Like that mm-hmm. is definitely a, a movie that uh, did well. I think people just watched it at the exact right time in their formative years as especially for me like as a 40 year old you know that has so many friends who uh became such big sports fans that was kind of their introduction into like sports movies and sports baseball and it was something that we really hadn't seen because most baseball movies were formed made for adults absolutely you couldn't watch major league when we were little we couldn't watch Bull bad Durham news bears yet. bad news bears all of those types of right. movies mm-hmm. this was like literally like hand picked for us to watch and i think that's why so many people love it and i've talked to many people who have watched it afterwards and realized um, maybe that wasn't so great. Oh, it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but will they acknowledge it? Like, I, I yeah. totally appreciate your candor and acknowledging it. Like, yeah. I don't know that everyone could do that because they want to cling so fiercely oh, to these things that they treasure from their youth, right? A billion percent. And I think you made a great point, too, with, like, the hand-holding. The thing that I immediately thought of was the erector set scene, which is actually kind of a cre- clever little thing when they're looking to go get the baseball and stuff. He can't help but to just like talk you through that this whole thing was being set up and they thought this was going to be it. You can't just watch the movie and uh, figure out what you're going to do. And by the way, it is worth pointing out, this guy was the guy who wrote Radio Flyer, which is one of the most, If I don't know if you remember the movie Radio Flyer, Christy. I don't. It is one of the most bizarre movies about these kids who are having these fantasies while they're getting abused. And it is unbelievable that this movie was made in 92 uh mr ebert was not happy about it he did a very scathing <laughs> review. i do remember that but this guy also made movies like beethoven's third beethoven's fourth national lampoons barely legal and uh, ace ventura the junior pet detective i think ace ventura real- jr you gotta yes, specify the, yeah ace ventura jr I'm, i very much apologize for that um <laughs> that is um that gives you kind of an eye. And look, that's a little bit of an ad hominem argument. You know, people make good movies, people make bad movies. But I think it gives you kind of an idea of the quality that certain people are capable mm-hmm. of doing. And the, the, the performances aren't great. Like yeah. the pacing isn't great. The And again, what do you what did you think of the, the needle drops? I mean, they're just songs that we hear a lot in movies that take place in this era. Yeah. You know, green onions and tequila. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just the very obvious choices as far as like oh. the music supervision goes. But again, you know, it was 30 years ago. Sure. And I, I do wonder whether 
a lot of filmmakers now are more astute about trying to find more varied examples of songs that would have played, you know, or were evocative of that era or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah, we, can't, sure. we can't hear Gimme Shelter over and over and over again, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I always forget the name of the uh, the song that plays at the beginning of every Vietnam movie, uh, Fortunate Son. Like that, that one is uh, played yeah. out quite a bit. And then, you know, like uh, the America the Beautiful that's playing during the fireworks scene and just <laughs> over and over again. Also, this movie's pretty sexist, Christy. Like, oh my it, God. It's a pretty darn sexist movie, even for, and I'm not excusing sexism at any time, but even for 1993, this is a pretty darn sexist movie. The thing that happens with Marley Shelton wouldn't happen in a movie today. Oh, gosh, no. The idea that like he tricks her, he pretends to drown yes. to to try to kiss her, and then yes, she kicks him out, but then she waves to him all the time, and then ends up marrying him and having nine kids and staying in this shitty town yes. and open and running a store like that's horrible. That's not Ugh. a good message for girls. <laughs> and that end narration, by the way, is just awful. Like, it, it's just like it, it, they, they think they're being clever, giving all these guys the animal house treatment of what happened to them and stuff like that. Yeah, that's um, bad. How, how about the James Earl Jones uh, little side piece? What did you think of that? That's the only good part of this whole movie. I like, I would so. like a whole movie about James Earl Jones. Which, like, clearly, they're playing off of Field of Dreams there, right? Yes, How many absolutely. years earlier did Field of Dreams come out? Like five, something like that. Right. I think 88 for Field of Dreams, yeah. They're so lucky that James Earl Jones said yes to this movie. <laughs> he has no reason to, right? So are, no. are we to assume that he was like a Negro Leagues player and he knew Babe Ruth? Yes. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately was blinded in an incident that yeah. takes place. And uh, that's... Uh, and they, they can't even really, um, that movie can't even like uh, break that part down. It has to be some sort of, they can't even talk about like the segregation thing. They, they completely yeah. side piece that, which would have been yeah. an interesting thing to hear about how he was just as good as any of them, but didn't get a chance to play against them because right. of the lack of segregation that was happening. That could have been an interesting thing to talk yeah. about as well. But instead you have to show five minutes of kids throwing up on a tilt a whirl and probably cut your own <laughs> time down. And that's that scene, by the way, just just show what happens after. Just show you could show like some stuff on their shirt that said that they threw up. You don't have to have that whole dang thing take place. I actually think they didn't go big enough on it. I don't usually <laughs> okay. like gross out humor. Nice. I usually nice. I don't like like totally gratuitous like poop jokes or sure. whatever. But sure. if you're gonna do it, go big. The way they did it looks yeah. so chintzy. They just like yeah. threw some like wet dog food on the ground or something. Fair, Chili. Fair. <laughs> so should we give numbers do i get to give a number on the breakfast um, Sunday podcast do we do numbers on was it greater where you wait i think we just try to decide at the end was it greater oh, where okay. you wait we I, vote i will just and... say i was eight i was definitely eight i wasn't actually eight but if for all intents and purposes yeah. i was very much an eight-year-old for this metaphorically yeah. you were eight yeah i agree this was not a good movie and i'm so pleased to hear you say this because i was so afraid that i was going to come on here and like dump all over your favorite baseball <laughs> movie from childhood the one that made you all. like the baseball expert that you are today so i'm pleased to see that you had you have evolved in your taste thank you thank you so much this was so fun thank you for doing yeah. this I and mean, you guys have asked us to bring in friends who are of different ages that is younger than we are <laughs> to pick movies that they love from childhood so this is a great opportunity to do that so thank you chris and let us know if it was great or we were a explain the nostalgia to us because we're very confused <laughs>